What's going on, guys? Sensible Prepper Live. We've got Prepper School. Who knows what the volume is? We're not even keeping up with it anymore. <laughs> uh, we've had a lot, and this will be in the Prepper School playlist. But today we've got a very serious subject. You know, and we're not saying it's happening. We're not saying it's going to happen, but we're going to talk about some reasons why that we wanted to bring this subject up. Mm -hmm. And I think it's one that there's a lot of stuff going on. We're a divided nation. And so before we get started, though, it's great to have Robbie Wheaton back with us today. And uh, Robbie has uh, Wheaton Arms. They do block aftermarket parts. He does really nice custom gun work if you need armor cuts, things like that. But he has a YouTube channel called Robbie Wheaton. And uh, there is a link down below the description. You can click on it, go to it. Been a competitive shooter forever and uh, on the national uh, and national uh, competitor. And um, just great to have him with us today. Well also, rounded in my guy 101 skills. Well rounded. Also go kart racer and also <laughs> a lot of other things. So um, great to have Robbie with us. And he and I always laugh a lot anyway. Uh, but also, Sarah Max, over on the uh, monitoring questions, and if you have any kind of questions, anytime you want to start posting those questions, she'll take note of them, and then when we take a break, uh, you know, we can address some of those. Uh, if we can keep it toward the what the subject would be great, but we'll answer whatever questions you have, because that's what this is about. The better my neighbor's prepared, the better I'm prepared. Mm -hmm. And so today we're going to talk about something. I came across this, and for years... Uh, you know, this is a subject that's been coming up over and over. I remember my father-in-law, and this was probably 10 years ago. He said, no, it was longer than that. It was about 20 years ago. He said, do you think there's ever going to be a civil war in the U.S.? And I looked at him and I went, really? No, I don't really, I don't, I don't think that. I, I did, at the time. <clears throat> another, another civil war. Yeah, another civil war. Yeah, there was one <laughs> civil war. Didn't turn out so well. Um, us being from the South, you know, but um, seriously. Um, you know, is there a possibility of the Civil War? And so I've been seeing different things pop up, um, you know, different universities doing studies, doing surveys, big, mm -hmm. big surveys. And at this point right now, 30 percent of Americans surveyed believe that there is a there's going to be a civil war. Uh, and, and that's a large number of people. That is. That's almost what Biden's uh, popularity rating is right now. <laughs> I think it's more than that. I think he's, he's, I think the survey is more than that. <laughs> but listen, guys, whether you're on the right or the left, whether you're moderate, whatever you are, um, you know, it's something that concerns us all. Yep, that's right. And it's one of those things we, we see the polarization. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we can see it. I mean, there's so many uh, different subjects that people are becoming very, very attached to. Let's take our side for a minute. Gun control. You know, it, it's a guaranteed right under the Constitution, but it's always under attack. And, you know, and then there's threats and we get upset. And, you know, and then, of course, you go to the other side where, you know, you go. I mean, there's a bazillion different, uh, you know, minority, um, you know, things that are going on with minorities, whether it's the black Latinos, the Asians, you know, their rights, what they want and, and what, you know, uh, trans. That's a big one right now. Just the LGBTQT, LMNOP, you know, that or that that mindset, you know, is definitely something that the border crossing, the homeless situation, defund the police. I mean, you can line it up abortion. I mean, there's so many different polarizing topics, polarizing mm -hmm. things that are being brought to us. Uh, I think that the media plays a large part in keeping us riled up. Yeah. Uh, but. One of the biggest problems with this polarization is we can have disagreements and we can have, you know, we can discuss it. We can argue our side. The problem is, is when we stop listening, mm -hmm. when both parties stop listening, a lot of that has to do with social media pouring in and feeding us exactly what we're searching, what we're looking for. Yeah, a lot of that, you're right. That A lot of that is that AI algorithm with social media that only shows you what you want to see or what it thinks you want to see instead of showing you both sides of it. Right. And to take this step back and take a look, um, you know, and two, there are moral types of things that, that, you know, I mean, I'm a, a Christian, I'm, you know, and there are certain ideals that I have that I'm pretty solid on. I mean, and I say pretty solid, I am dead rock hard solid on them, yep. you know, and, that, so these, th and then there are others that feel like climate change is going to destroy the earth, and they are very passionate about that. Uh, you know, that's funny. I, I made a post a couple of weeks ago about about climate change, and if you look at 
United States compared to the rest of the world. The United States is a very, very clean, very green climate uh, with the way that we that we control pollution and everything. You go to other countries in the world and you may be there for weeks or maybe even months before you ever see the sun because the smog and pollution is so thick and so bad in the air. And this is a lot of your, a lot of countries outside of the United States. We don't have that issue here. No, um, maybe in Los Angeles and they've done a lot with that. Right, right. But so smog and pollution is a, is a terrible, terrible issue in a lot of parts of the world. We can do, we can be completely green in the United States. Uh, electric cars, I don't know, don't really know how green that is. That's not but, green. Yeah, you know, <laughs> wind, wind energy, uh, hydro energy, you know, completely green with everything. We could even plug up the cow's butts. I mean, <laughs> everything completely green, right? And we're still not even going to scratch climate, climate control or climate pollution across the world because of all of the other countries that produce so much pollution. And really the studies are showing that, that I mean, the, the ice on Antarctica and Antarctica are actually growing. You know, I saw a, a funny meme. It was the uh, Plymouth Rock mm -hmm. and it was taken back in the 1800s, this photo. And then it said 1927, it looked exactly the same. <laughs> and then in 2023, they took another photo of it. It looked exactly the same. There's no increase in water. It's yep. just right there. I mean, you know, but, but that's the kind of stuff, you know, that people get very emotional about mm -hmm. and, and we make fun of the other side and that goes both ways. Uh, so is there civil war coming? You know, and that is the, the one thing I do want to mention right up front is guys, I don't, number one, support a civil war at this point because it is devastating to all. Yep. But um, also when it happens or if it happens, it's going to build up. It's not like next week we're going to have the yeah. civil war. Next Tuesday yeah. at 12, we're skipping Facebook Live. Yeah, we're, we're getting out of here, man. <laughs> but, you know, it's it's not something that just happens. Even during the, Ameri the first American Civil War, mm -hmm. it was years and years of buildup yep. and, and problems and, and just where it became – just a lockdown, a gridlock, and there was no compromise whatsoever. And then that's when it comes out. I have a good friend of mine that uh, worked for the CIA for years, and he was all over the world. And he told me, he goes, no one will have a revolution. And really a civil war is kind of a, a revolution. Mm -hmm. it's, no one will have that until they just can't live with it any longer. It has to be totally intolerable before somebody will do something. Yep. We're very comfort. We're comfort creatures, creatures of comfort. Well, and you know, whether you want to say you're oppressed or whether you want to say you live a very good life, either way, everyone in this country is pretty comfortable right now. Oh, There's yeah. not a whole lot that the majority of people within this country want for. Um, you know, you may want a new car, you may want more land, or you may want, there may be things that you want, but at the end of the day, we're very comfortable. You know, the majority of us have a place to live. Majority of us have plenty of food. You know, we're we live in a very comfortable society. Yeah. And until that comfort's jerked out from under your feet, there most people are not going to escalate things to to the level of a civil war. Right. Right. And you know, and the other side of it, which is uh, just a counterpoint, is just like in Venezuela, mm -hmm. they've gotten to a point where it is unbearable. Yep. But they they are powerless to do anything about it. It's because their ability and their rights to defend themselves have been taken away from them. Right. And that's why it's so important to protect your civil rights, whatever they are, protect those civil rights. Uh, but of course, gun control is one of the biggest mm -hmm. uh, because that is one of the things our founding fathers laid down. They said, you have got to retain the, the, the power of defending yourself and defending from tyrannical governments and governments or whatever. That's right. And it could be tyrannical people trying to come into your house yeah. and take what you have. I mean, it, so it is one of those basic God-given rights. It is not something that is endowed by the government, but by our creator. And, you know, one thing that, yeah, you know, I look at it, we, we're we in a very, you know, I would say almost a isolated bubble here in the South where we live. People people look at the South and they're like, oh, the South's always polarized, they're racist, all this and that. And I totally disagree with that. I, totally. I, think, I think the South is probably the most tolerant group of people within our country. Um, but with that being said, you look at other states, uh, other large cities, large metropolitan areas, and you see people being attacked because of their skin color. You see businesses being burned because of the people's skin color, ethnicity that, that run or own that business. And you know, when you start seeing violence escalate in, in areas 
those are the areas where you could you could possibly see a civil war really start to break out. You know, not necessarily here where we are because we are very tolerant of one another, but in other areas of the country where people are much less tolerant uh, of one another or people's beliefs or their values or whatever, I think there's a, a much larger chance of maybe not a nationwide civil war, but an isolated yeah. civil war breaking out in pockets around this country. Right. And while the states are typically a little more, you know, there are certain states that are more either conservative or liberal, mm -hmm. uh, there's a mix in those states. Yep. So, you know, it, there's a lot that goes on mm -hmm. with all this. And uh, one thing about it, there's, then this was the uh, National Shooting Foundation or Shooting Sports Foundation did a, a study or they released these numbers where they said there were 434 million guns in the U.S. I think that number's higher than that. But that's 1.3 guns for every person. Yeah, that's a pretty conservative number, I believe. Yeah. And the thing is, is their gun control does nothing but takes people that are law abiding citizens and hampers them. So, you know, that that's one of the things that, you know, that just get us riled up. But the thing is, is the oppression real? You know, I was in a gas uh, or a grocery store the other day. And I was going through and there was a, a black family buying groceries. There was a Hispanic family buying groceries. There was an Asian woman that walked by. And I was just kind of like, this is normal. This yeah. is just life. That's this right. is this is what it is. It's not, I had no angst or any kind of feeling at all, except I was kind of like, this is cool. Well, the South is a melting pot of yeah. all different kinds of nationalities and genders. Yeah. And I mean, they're, they're just, it's just a, and so I think sometimes the oppression, is it real? Is the oppression real? You know, so um, yeah, I think, I think the answer to that question is yes and no. I think it in certain parts of this country, absolutely yes. I think in other parts of this country, absolutely no. Yeah, and yeah, you know, that you could really divide it by region, region to region, even you know, city to city, county to county, right. um, and not not necessarily even by state, but even breaking it down into regions where there's there's definitely oppression, more oppression in some areas, and a lot less in other areas, or almost none in other areas. Well, and there's some areas, even in the South, that there, there is, especially small towns that sure. are predominantly one race. You know, it, yep. it can be like that, a little bit of, of, of prejudice, but typically it's not it's not there. Yeah, uh, I don't encounter it yeah. at all with my no. circle. I don't encounter any of it. No. Uh, and you know, the thing is, though, is the, the whole theories behind civil war. It's something that builds up. It's something. So and we're, and we're going to address this in a couple of minutes. We're going to take some questions first, but uh, we're going to tell you some things to do in case there is a situation. Uh, and again, like Robbie said, it could be just in, it could be localized. That's right. It could be a certain area that's just going through a conflict yep. and the people are like, I'm done with this and they're having it out. Uh, and then it could be, you know, but the funny thing is though, and, and it's just like January 6th, you know, that was kind of the, where they really kind of touted, the conservatives really going basilistic, you know, and then Tucker showed all that stuff and it really wasn't what it was. Uh, it was, it was blown up. Uh, but the fact is, is most people have families, they have businesses, they have investments, they have, they, they have their lives to live. And it seems like the, the bad apples that are out there are people that are pretty much just, they don't really have anything to live for. Mm -hmm. They're just doing whatever. I mean, you look at Antifa. I mean, those guys, they're just out there with a, because they have no purpose really or any cause. So they're making a cause and they're going out. And they're just having just wholesale destruction with any side they want to jump on. And, you know, and that makes it kind of like you go, wow. But it's a good thing that we had the things we do, that we're not right doing those crazy things because we do have a lot to lose. So um, let's go to some questions and then we're going to kind of kick on down if we have any. I know we've been talking about something that's, uh, and if you and if you want to throw some in, I think Sarah Max would have two. <laughs> I guess we'll get, give you a big down, yeah. downer. <laughs> From KJATX ask potassium iodide, are all brands pretty much the same, 130 milligrams? Um, you know, I haven't done a real study on it. Typically I'll just order some if I need it. You know I mean? If I want to have some on hand and potassium iodide is something that fills your thyroid, uh, during a new, and there's taken during a nuclear exchange of some sort. And so it, it fills your thyroid because radiation is attracted to your thyroid. And that's the, that's the thing. But, uh, no, I mean, you know, I really hadn't studied that out as far as, do you know anything? A little bit. Yeah. There's, there's some companies that market it specifically for, um, taking it as a radiation, uh, 
inhibitor to keep you from absorbing it. And then there's some companies that market it just as potassium iodide. And a lot of times with that, it has other vitamins and minerals and nutrients mixed in with it. Um, me personally, I look for the stuff that is that is marketed specifically for uh, radiation. Poisoning. Yes, yeah. yes. And, and I'll buy that versus buying just the a bulk bottle of potassium iodide that may or may not have a bunch of other stuff in it. Yeah. And I like the ones that are, they're covered in foil, just right. like your standard. A lot yeah. of your pills are, That's they, right. they really kind of preserve them and keep them. But, um, you know, they just did a, um, a, a, a training on a nuclear fallout or a nuclear event. And I, I can't remember the city. It was a pretty major city. It was like Austin, Texas or right. LA or something. New York did one last year. Yeah. <clears throat> and, uh, the end of the yeah, year last you know, year. the thing is guys, is there are threats, there are threats out there uh, similar to what we're talking about today, uh, where it builds up and, you know, something could happen. Uh, honestly, a global war to me is more viable as far as an option than probably the civil, a civil war, yep. second civil war. Well, you know, one of the, a big concern that I do have is not necessarily a nuclear attack on the United States. But say a nuclear attack on Ukraine, you know, if it's if it's a high level uh, air burst, you're going to get radiation spread. It could spread around the world. Um, and, you know, with the Gulf Stream and everything, it could bring it right across the United States. So that that's always a big concern of mine, that not necessarily a nuclear attack on the United States, but a nuclear disaster in other parts of the world or a nuclear attack in other countries. And we end up getting a lot of radiation in our country from that nuclear attack there. But it's according to how desperate, you know, we, we're having them kind of line up. We've got Russia, we've got China, you know, and they're kind of working a little bit more closer together than before. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's like and then we've got the situation in Ukraine and, you know, there's just a lot of tension right there. Yep. And then Taiwan, which really is probably even a more of a danger at this point. So um, and, you know, guys, one of the reasons why Taiwan is such a, a hot spot or and is because they produce like the majority of microchips. <laughs> So if you want to know where hotspots are, figure out where the money is, mm -hmm. and then you can find out what the hotspots are. Uh, Luana asks, will a solar generator withstand an EMP attack? Uh, there's some debate in that. I think the generator itself would probably have some problems, according to the uh, the location of the EMP, the power, that what it puts out. Mm -hmm. But with the circuits and everything that go in there, there are those who feel like, and this is the thing, guys, about EMP. There's no real concrete, this is what's going to happen. Uh, there's a lot of tests that have been done, especially with the U.S. government, and they're trying to harden things, mm -hmm. but they really don't know the extent. Uh, they did have a solar flare back in the uh, 1800s, late 1800s, and it burned up all the telegraph lines. Yep. There were no computer chips there. Uh, so, you know, we don't, and, and um, solar flares uh, usually are similar to what an EMP would, would do. So, you know, again, there, there are people out there that know, in fact, one of my, one of my buddies, uh, this part of our prepper group, uh, he sets up Faraday cages in hospitals and he, he oversees them to make sure they're doing them right for MRI machines. And, you know, there's a lot that goes into a lot of that stuff, but um, there are covers that you can actually, a Faraday bag that you can put over your solar generator if you want to protect it. So, um, but I think that probably the, the generator itself, we have one. And uh, I think that it, it could be susceptible. I tell you, I've, so I've been doing quite a bit of research on EMPs lately. And one of the one of the interesting things that I've seen about it is uh, basically anything that's hardwired, your your telephones, your power lines and things like that will be unaffected. The power source that is controlled by computers uh, or anything with a microchip on it is going to be directly affected your older automobiles that use a, a point style distributor will be unaffected. Mechanical vehicles will be unaffected. Uh, but any of your vehicles that have any type of computer chips in them will be directly affected. Any of your electronics that have computer chips in it will be directly affected. And two, it depends on how far or how, you know, how near, how far from the blast you are, that's going to have an impact in it. But it's uh it's pretty interesting that a lot of your, how a lot of your mechanical things will be completely unaffected, but anything that is digital uh, or has any kind of any kind of chips in it, it will be directly well, affected. Well, it's that high electric uh, um, um, conductivity mm -hmm. and different things right. that really because they're they're made to be able to be highly conductive. Yep. And with the older automobiles, it's not so much. Right. So um, 
again, guys, here's the thing too. There, you know, there's some simple fixes. There are Faraday bags out there, all mm -hmm. kind of small bags. You can get them for about 20 bucks. You can put certain items in there. Uh, but then also there are different ideas. One thing that uh, one guy was talking about is if you have something that's magnetic and you have, let's say, your um, whatever device you're trying to protect, you wrap it in mylar. It doesn't touch the outside. It, it, it's through an electro pulse. So it's going to have, con you know, um, it's got to be conductive. And so having that mylar or something to actually separate it from the, the, the surface of the uh, the conductive metal actually helps protect it. Yep. Insulates. And even, even a, a nuclear attack, uh, air burst creates an EMP pulse. Oh, yeah. So, you know, even if it's not a direct EMP blast, but is a, a nuclear blast, you're still going to get an EMP from an air burst from any of your nuclear weapons as well. Right. All right. So, anything? Oh, I was. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, Guyver X says, I have a question. Do you think with the state of the things in this country, we have passed the point of turning it around? You know, I, the, the one thing that really kind of um, bothers me is, as far as that goes, is it's a destruction of one side. It's like a, it's just a, a complete destruction and there's not going to be any satisfaction until that is completely eliminated. Uh, I'm seeing that more and more. Uh, you know, the thing is, is uh, will the other side have any concessions? Mm -hmm. I mean, let's let's take, um, you know, I mean, there's a lot of different things out there that we could we could look at. But, you know, there are things where, you know, let's take homosexuality, for instance. That's something that for, for a long time was completely unacceptable in our society, completely. And people did suffer oppression. People were and and you know, they took a lot of steps to kind of step out and say, I'm this way and I'm proud of it and I'm going to live this way. And, you know, it's funny because I was like, OK, you know, hey, I, I don't have any angst against that person. That's fine. You do what you want to do. I may not ag agree just like I don't agree with other issues, but it doesn't mean that uh, I'm not tolerant and, and I don't hope them the best. I have friends for years, different friends all over that. We're that way. And you know what? I'm, I'm fine with it. It's like, OK, they're good people. They're good people. And I think the one problem right now is, is that we're looking at the other side as inhuman. And, and I think that's where things really get ugly. Uh, you know, if I look at a, 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 you know, I have friends that are Democrats. I mean, you know, they're not as close to friends. Republicans, but No, seriously. I mean, you know, and I can have a lot of you know, great conversations with them and uh, and have for years been that way, you know, to be very open and just talk and be civil and just have a discourse. But um you know, the thing is, I think we're beginning to look at the other side as just, oh, you're that way. Well, and then you kind of look at them in that lens. Mm -hmm. I, I don't disagree with that at all. You know, I think that I think there is still an opportunity for us to turn things around within this country. It's going to start with the leadership within our country. It's going to it's going to have to start from the top down uh, to see any kind of significant change when you have. A divisive government, then you're going to have a divisive people. Yeah, and there's there's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. Until until our government can come together and reach across the aisle and do things that are best for our country, instead of what's best for their own political agenda, I think we're going to continue to see this divisiveness, and I think we're going to continue to see it grow. Well, and you know, I think it goes beyond that. I think one of the things we have academia who really promotes a lot of really radical liberal ideas and thoughts, and they pour that out onto to college students who go out and become CEOs of corporations, mm -hmm. just like we've seen with Budweiser. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, uh, turning this thing and it, and it backfired on them big time. But I think there's a lot of corporate money that pours into Congress. I don't think that our government has as much control over it as they used to because it's been allowed. And, you know, so, you know, you don't you don't know. I mean, I, I, I personally, I don't really see it getting any better. <laughs> I, I don't see it, but, um, you know, things, something could change. Something could make a difference. Yeah. And, and you always have to have hope. Personally, I feel like that a big, huge revival in the country would be the only answer, but that's, you know, that's my, my stance. Um, let's go to, let's go to what to do now. So we're getting off the, the civil war subject and some people are going to plug in here just to see what we have to say about it. So, there are things, there are steps that really, if it's coming, I'm not saying you need to take these steps now because I think this is still a distance away. I think you will know 
as it comes up. I think when it gets close, you know, it's, there's going to be a tipping point if it happens. And so I think that, you know, but these are some of these things I think are important uh, that step outside of standard prepping. Uh, and the first off is, you know, if something starts to happen, you want to secure your family. Now, we want to secure our family in any SHTF situation. That's right. But when it becomes a shooting war and you have two opposing sides that are meeting up in your house, and if you ever seen those old Civil War, the old farmhouse where they're battling over, they're, they're fighting around the, the farmhouse. You do not want to be in that farmhouse. No. <laughs> and the same thing is here is, you know, one of the big problems with uh, any kind of event like this is a lot of times communications disappear. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's no communication <clears throat> because that is communications are vital when it comes to different opposing forces. That's right. That's and so, you know, they're, that's one of the first things that's going to go. And so you're not going to be able because you could be just a person. You could say, hey, I've seen a bunch of you know people over here that are, you know, on the other side and, and translate that. So they're going to that's one thing I feel like they'll try to. So we've got to if things start to heat up and you're starting to go, OK, we're headed for it. It's just a matter of when um, and it's going to happen anytime. You really need to keep close tabs on your family members, uh, knowing where they are so you can get to them. Because you want to be able to, you don't want to be separated. War has separated more people. You know, look at Europe in World War II. I mean, just Ukraine right now. Yeah, the people, <clears throat> thousands of people going down the streets, you know, just trying to get out, losing everything. And so, but you want to make sure that you keep your family together. One thing that I've, I've mentioned a number of times is have current photos of your family. Current photos, even of each individual child, your wife, whoever. Yeah, not digital. Hard copies. Yeah, hard copies, because you want to be able to go, hey, have you seen this person? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and so that's one thing that a lot of times we don't really think about in a digital age when we don't keep, you know, we used to keep photos in our billfold. That's right. Now, they used to always get messed up yeah. because they get all sweaty <laughs> and sticky. But, uh, you know, we kept photos in our billfolds. Now we don't do that because we have a phone. We can just go have some photos made, yeah. you know, and, and keep those photos together. Yeah. Again, your official documents, you want to have those kind of in a spot where, you know, if I need to go, this is what I'm going to do. Listen, if you're a prepper already, some of these things should are a no brainer. Yeah, you yep. should already be doing some of this stuff. But because you could be into a, an SHTF situation and need to find your family. That's right. I remember one time we were at Disney World. This has been a number of years ago before Disney went off the rails and we were at Disney World. My kids were really small and I remember we were in this big area and it was just nobody really around that area. And there were some benches about 50 feet on the other side. And we were over there. They're playing. They were like four and five. And all of a sudden, we didn't see it, but these doors opened up and all these people poured through. And there's my kids, you know. And then they were they were gone, mm -hmm. you know. And I went through, you know, and I got them. You know, you can be separated from your family. So make sure that they're secure. Make sure that you have points to get to, uh, to get them back home. Because, you know, if, if you find, and then, of course, we'll talk about bug out in a minute, but. This is just to make sure if things are escalating around you, you want to keep your family safe. Uh, so knowing their locations and having a plan with your family. Number two is secure your supplies. Yeah, I think this is a huge one because you look back at the, the first civil war when the Union Army made its way across the South. One of the first things they were looking for were supplies. Because right. they were they were a large army. They were moving quickly, especially with Sherman with his march across the South. They're a large army. They're moving very quickly, and with a large army moving quickly, they're not able to carry enough supplies with them. So they're looking to confiscate any kind of supplies they can find: food, ammunition, gear, radios, comms, all of that. They're looking to confiscate it and pull all of that stuff into into their unit and take it with them when they go. And well, it deprives or, you from right. that, which is another reason for them to take it. It's a huge reason. Yep. So you're now you're without all of your supplies. They've taken all of your supplies and they're moving on to the next town and the next group of people so they can replenish again with everything that they've consumed as they're moving through. And, you know, one thing uh, to consider is, you know, if you have boys and like girls for that matter, but if you have boys that are fighting age and yep. they could be much younger than 18, right? You know, young boys. You know, those can get caught up mm -hmm. with either side. Yep. You know, it, you may not, you may be out of this fight. If you ever watched the movie Shenandoah, 
with uh, Jimmy Stewart mm -hmm. and his son, they were neutral. They weren't doing anything. And his son went down to the river and found an old civil war. I mean, a, a Confederate cat Kepi and he put it on. And then all of a sudden this union, these union troops came around a corner and there he was and they put him in prison, mm -hmm. you know, and then he fought for the union. I mean, it was the biggest mess you've ever seen. Yeah. And, you know, the thing is, is that is something to consider. If this is not, if you don't have a dog in this fight, which I, I really think there's going to be few people, there's going to be some people that don't. And if you don't, you don't want your boys to be, con, you know, conscripts into right. something you want no part of. Uh, and, you know, and, and, and there's a number of different ways that could happen. But, you know, the thing is your food, your water, your basic supplies that honestly, if you're prepping, you should have that stuff put back. But there is a danger, just like Robbie said, and uh, of being those being confiscated and food being illegal to hoard right. could be a problem. I mean, that's one thing it could lead up to is they start to put restrictions. Um, you know. And I mean, we saw that with people buying large quantities of toilet paper back in 2020, you know, warehouses full of toilet paper, rubber gloves, masks and stuff. And they were seized right. by the government because they were they were hoarding those items and, and price gouging to sell them. And the government says, oh, no, you can't do that. Even though they bought it with their own money to be able to resell, the government says, no, you can't do that. We're going to take all of that from you. Yeah. So it can happen and it does happen. Yeah, it does happen. And, you know, OK, so one thing about, let's say, food supplies is, um, you know, thinking about where to secure your food supplies. Uh, you know, if you have just one place where you have your food supplies, they come in, they're like, OK, we'll take this have an alternate area or maybe have a limited amount of food sitting out, you know, have a, something that looks nice. that looks like you've got some food stored back and have your main stash in a completely different area, you know, and that may be a way to save some of that. You know, uh, one of the things about an area that is definitely, if this looks like where we keep our food, they're going to find those places. Yep. So taking your food, being more prudent in how you store your food supplies. Uh, and that goes with any SHTF situation. If yep. you have raiders come to your house or whoever, some crazies, you know, they could also take your food supplies as well. So really, I've always been big about separating, yep. separating things. Uh, one of the things that uh, is also like firearms. You have all your firearms in one safe. There it is. You know, and it's according to where you live, guys. I know some of you guys live in apartments and this, these are just not options. Uh, but maybe a storage unit that you have set, a, set off site which that's one thing we do. We have a storage unit. We keep certain things there in our storage unit. And so if something were to really happen, we couldn't get back to our home, but we had to get out of Dodge. We can stop by our storage unit, grab the things we need. And of course, storage units and things like that may be compromised as well, mm -hmm. but maybe not because they're not really going to be looking for, I don't think they go through the trouble, but yep. it's according to how big the the other side is right uh, and so your water of course you know you want to have these things set aside to be ready uh, obviously water could be a very big target yeah if you have water stored up they're like oh we need this water we need this hey we, this is for the calls and you can understand it if i was coming through an area and i had a calls and i'm looking and we got to feed our troops and hey we're fighting for you you need to turn up you know you need to turn over all your stuff uh, you know, that that's something that this reasonable in some ways, but yet it's just not right. But OK, so what are some items, though? And it's something Robbie kind of brushed through yep. with. But it's true. What are some items that, you know, that they're going to be looking for? Of course, guns. Yep. Ammunition. Food. Like we just talked about. Food. Yep. Um, tactical supplies. You've got vests. You've got plate carriers. You've got, you know holsters and different things. Uh, those are items that, you know, that definitely would be something that would be worth confiscating of them. Ammunition is going to be a huge one. Ammunition is going to be a big one. Right. I mean, definitely. Now, some of the odd calibers, if right. you've got the handguns for them, they'll probably take them. You know, uh, I'm sure in Ukraine right now, whatever they can get their hands on, they're, they're using. That's right. And that's happened all through the, through the war. I mean, all through the world, even in Vietnam, that was a big thing. There it was, was a lot that's of right. all kind of firearms being used, different calibers by the Viet Cong or the VC. Um, and so, you know, they took whatever they could use. And so, you know, it's one of those things, again, separate, separate. Uh, even in a home burglary situation, they come to the safe, but you've got something else in the back that's secure. Mm -hmm. You have a safe security system and uh, have an alternate. And I think that's a, a good choice to have that put back. Uh, one thing is radios, radios and comms. And we're going to touch on to that in a minute, but radios, comms, anything like that, 
In fact, one of the things that, uh, that a lot of countries do is they outlaw comms mm-hmm. and radios. So if you're in possession of them, you're breaking the law. And so, but communication is going to be really vital. Uh, and so, and again, we'll, we'll touch on that in a minute. Fuel is going to be a huge one. Any kind of fuel you have, even propane tanks, things like that, uh, that kind of stuff could be just just picked up. You well, know, you've got troop movements. You're moving a lot of people. You've got to have a way to be able to move them. And we use vehicles to move people and fuel. You have to have fuel for those vehicles. Right. If your fuel supplies are down, they're not able to get fuel trucks into your gas stations to refuel them. The fuel that you have at your house, the fuel that you have in your vehicle. Right. And we're not talking about sticking a hose down your gas tank and siphoning the gas out. They will just poke a hole in the gas tank and drain it in right. a bucket. You know, so, and then not only does that take all of your fuel, but it also renders your vehicle useless because you can't put <laughs> fuel back in your tank. <laughs> Unless you have a, unless you have a, a battery powered car, unless you have a battery powered car, That's <laughs> then they'll right. take the battery because they can use it for something else. <laughs> so um, yeah, any kind of uh, fuel, and and again, that's not just gasoline, but that's that's a good point. You know, they can take it right out of your car. But you know, propane, different kind of fuel, uh, natural gas. You let's say you depend on natural gas, and they'll mm-hmm. turn that line off, and they'll they'll you know if if they need it, if they can use it. Um, anything that cr- can create explosives. Uh, and that's kind of a, a, a strange one because most of us don't have things around the house that can cause explosives. Actually, most of us do. We just don't understand how to use it correctly. Right. So they revise top weapons. That's right. And that's a broad, broad area. You know, but but expanding your knowledge base on what, what you can use um, to protect yourself and right. being able to know how to store it and where to store it is a good thing to know. Like take brake fluid and pool chlorine. I'm not familiar with that one. Yeah, they did that on, was it... Um, Brett and Link. Yeah. <laughs> that thing went. <laughs> it, was, it was hilarious. But, you know, and of course, fertilizers. And, and they've gotten to where, especially with farms, fertilizers, uh, certain ones, they will uh, they can confiscate those as well. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> alcohol. If you have alcohol, let's say you've got your wine cellar and you've got your, your liquor cabinet and, you know, whatever. And they'll come and they'll clean that thing out. All your bougie <laughs> bottles will be gone. You better hide your Jack Daniels <laughs> back in the back. But... Uh, you know, and that's something that uh, soldiers have been doing since the beginning of time, yep. unless you live in the Middle East, yeah. and then they're kind of funny <laughs> about it. Uh, so, you know, there are anything that the military, a military, it could be the U.S. military or it could be some rogue Confederate militia militia group. Uh, the danger of you losing your stuff can come from the bad guys or the good guys. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying which one's which. I'm just saying good that's guys right. or bad guys. If they're um, taking your stuff, they're all bad guys. Yeah, that's so that's the whole point. Is it doesn't matter. If they take your stuff, they've taken your stuff. And so you want to have some contingency plans. And especially if things get ramped up and you start to see some things happening, you really want to take it seriously and think about some ways to hide that stuff. Uh, but the one thing is, let's say somebody comes into my house and I'm a prepper. And so they see all this prepping stuff. They know I've got stuff. Mm. It's like a treasure trove. Yeah. You know, and they're like, oh, man, let's just get, we get this, we get this. So then they're going to nitpick your house to death. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's one of those things to kind of really think about long term. Uh, if this, if, again, guys, we're, we're just kind of thinking about it, putting that stuff, maybe starting to think now about it. But even in a standard SH, uh, SHTF situation, these things can also occur. So. Those are the things you need to secure. So anything you think that a military might want to use or whatever, your gold jewelry, mm-hmm. you know, that or your, your different jewelry that's, that has value to it. Anything of value can be yep. picked up. That's right. So um, think about that. You don't want to knock on the door and it's there's a bunch of soldiers standing there and they're like, turn over your stuff. And you're thinking, oh, crap, I should have hit that, <laughs> hit that silver somewhere else. It's too late now. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, communications. Now, this one, this one is one that's important. It's important to have communications in any situation, that's right. but especially in a situation of danger, when you do not know where the battle lines are moving to, uh, where troop movements are coming through, where whatever's happening. And like we talked about a minute ago, communications, having those that equipment could be illegal. Uh, you know, having a radio because they don't want for spies to be able to radio different people. Well, you know, here's the thing with with if if for some reason we have another a second civil war, you're not going to see clearly defined battle lines. There's not going to be like our first civil war, the North versus the South. You're going to see a lot of little militia groups spring up all around the country. And 
militia groups for this side, militia groups for this side. Then you're going to have the army that's trying to regulate all of this and, and control everything and, and squelch all of it. So it, it's going to be very difficult to track who is who, who's on what side, what side they're fighting for. And you can very easily get stuck in the middle with something like that and having shortwave communications to where, you know, you can communicate with people that are five, 10 miles away from you and know what's going on in their area versus and knowing what's going on in your area and being able to share information, whether it's people that you support, people you don't support, the military that's trying to, to wrangle all of this in, uh, or if the military picks a side and is on the side as well. You know, you, there's a lot of unknowns and a lot of variables with, with all of that, but communications will absolutely be key for staying up to speed on what's going on around you. Well, you know, and one thing that's, that some people just assume is that if something happens that, and and it's something that's supported by the U.S. military, mm -hmm. that, you know, and we're on, let's say we're on the other side, which heaven forbid, but let's say we are, then we've got this force that's the greatest military force in the world. Mm -hmm. But one thing about it is, guys, is there's a lot of both sides in the military. There are. And when you have state guards and things like that, there's going to be some, some rifts there. So, you know, I don't think it's just going to be one big, you know, it's just intact U.S. military. It's going to be this conglomeration and separation. Uh, well, one of the interesting things with the military right now is the military is having a really, really difficult time with recruiting uh, because of their wokeism that, that they have. Uh, there's a lot of people that are getting out of the military because of, of the direction that it's taken. There's a lot of people, you know, look at, look at the military kind of like, uh, kind of like Budweiser. All right. Budweiser has a very, very specific demographic that has predominantly bought their beer for the last hundred years, just for a round number. The military has a very predominant demographic that has enlisted for the last hundred years, just for a round number. Budweiser alienated their entire demographic that they sold to, and it's cost them billions of dollars. The military has alienated their entire demographic that they recruit from, and now their recruiting numbers have tanked. They're having a very difficult time getting people to join the military, which could be a good or a bad thing. If the military's demographic completely changes and they're only recruiting at this point from very woke people versus their traditional demographic, you're going to see a huge shift within the military and the military presence and the type of people that are in the military long term. Uh, and that's, you know, this we're kind of in the, the fledgling stages of all of that right now. So it'll be interesting to see in the next five to 10 years how all that plays out. But, you know, what's really scary is that plays on the national stage as well, or the, the world, world stage, stage as well. Yep. And, that's you know, correct. these countries know that we're that what's going on. Believe me, they know Absolutely. all these things and it does weaken our national defense, which is kind of scary, which would all these things would also apply to an invasion. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Not that that's on down the list of my priorities to worry yeah. about, but still it's, it is, you know, it's there. But um but two communications. One of the things about it, most of the uh, the most things will be jammed. You know, mm -hmm. there are certain ways they can jam most signals yep. and what's going on. Uh, but on the other side of it, you know, if you do have a shortwave radio, you may only want to listen, mm -hmm. listen to broadcast because one of the problems is, and with the sophisticated equipment, is if you're using like ham radio and you have this really nice antenna and you're you work, they can triangulate oh, and go right come right to you. Absolutely. And so you know it, it, that's one of the things. It may be just a burst. You know, just okay. Let's put that out. Let's put that out. But you know, hopefully there will be some communications going on so we can at least know something about what's going on around us. The worst thing in the world is to have a some force come on you and you have no earthly idea. Yep. At least if you have some warning, you can make better preparations. Um, so communications definitely needed, but also if you, if they outlaw communications, that could be a real threat to your safety. And, you know, that, that could be a problem as well. And two, you know, and one of the things that's been going around for years and years with the FEMA camp kind of situation, could camps be put out to take people and put them in certain areas, especially if they could be sympathetic from one side to the other. So let's say that you have a, a, a group that comes in and they take over this, let's say our area, mm -hmm. and they know that there's a lot of good old boys that are all pro Second Amendment and everything, you know, and conservative, uh, you know, so let's take them and let's put them, let's corral them into a certain area. And, you know, that is a possibility. So just lots of fun things that could yeah. happen. <laughs>
Um, do we have anything coming up with questions or okay, yeah. let's let's go to some questions. Um Lily to you says, how can we have a civil war and a world war at the same time? Well, you know, some people could, some countries hate the U.S. Mm -hmm. and they could take advantage. Well, even look back at the first civil war is a good example of that. You had uh, France was supporting the South. You had Britain and other countries that were supporting the North. So even, even almost 200 years ago, we were, there were still other countries throughout the world that were supporting different parts of the different parts of the United States based off of an agenda that they wanted. And I think you'd see something very similar to that. If we had another civil war, there would be certain part, certain countries that would support a certain demographic. There would be other countries that would support another demographic. And then I think there would be a lot of misinformation as well. Uh, just to try and just to try and cause issues and confuse people with what's going on. Well, let's take let's take Ukraine. Ukraine was part of Russia. There's a lot of Ukrainians in Russia, Russians in Ukraine. Yep. And it's not really a civil war, but it kind of is kind of has some roots in that. And so you have a lot of countries, including the U.S., that's mm -hmm. dumping tons of money into the Ukrainian side. Um, and so, you know, it does. And then you have China coming in and, and Iran coming in and then England coming in. So, you know, it's definitely something that um, maybe the civil war that we possibly could have could instigate a full on global mm -hmm. war, global war. Mm -hmm. uh, and then two, like vulnerabilities. <laughs> we have something like that happen. You think Taiwan's going to last about three minutes and Ukraine, for that matter. I mean, if we got to turn all of our attention to us, it definitely takes a lot of our influence around the world off. That's right. And so that's that definitely can cause some issues. Uh, but uh, yeah, like Robbie said, I mean, a lot of countries, their interest for them to for a weaker United States, that's an interest to a lot of countries. Absolutely. So, I mean, that a civil war alone would destabilize the dollar throughout the world, which is going to have global implications on financing. Um, you're going to see you would see a massive collapse in uh in the financial district around the world, if if the dollar if the dollar plunged because of the civil war, right? So, and you know, those are all little things that a lot of people don't even consider. You know that the dollar is going to collapse if there's a civil war. Your money is going to be worthless. We could have, like in the first civil war, multiple streams of currency once again, where one side had a currency, another side had a currency. So, currency is going to collapse. The global economy is going to collapse if we had a civil war. Generally, if your global economy collapses, you end up with wars in other countries, which if we had a civil war here could directly lead to a world war um, just with other countries pulling into the power vacuum and trying to trying to take over and assume world dominance and world power. Well, you know, I just read an article. It was really interesting. And it said that 23 states have now deemed precious metals, silver and gold to be currency. Mm -hmm. Now, originally in the Constitution, it was currency. It still is. Right. But they're reviving that <clears throat> idea. Right. And so having gold, silver, you know, and I've been big about this for years, mm -hmm. uh, especially with the threat of digital currency that's right around the, the corner. Yeah. And, you know, the uh, the restriction of cash and stuff like that is that having precious metals is, you know, we always look at these countries and we go, well, that country, man, they're backed by gold. Yep. Why do I personally, why am I not backed by gold and silver? And, you know, of course, again, the confiscation can come in with that as well. So that's something that you need to be very careful with. And has in the past. Yeah. Yep. All right. I'm sorry. We kind of got sidetracked. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Christian Mathis asked, do you think it would be more of a group versus group or the people versus the government or both? Both. And yeah. that was one of the things I was talking about earlier. I think you're going to see individual groups, um, individual militias um, battling each other. And the government is... Could kind of go either way, honestly. The government could be trying to trying to squash all of it on both sides, or the government could end up taking a side one way or the other. And the government could split. And the government, and the government could split. And more than likely, I think you'd see a, a big case of that where the government, the military as a whole, would end up splitting. And you would have you would have portions of the government or portions of the military move toward one group, you'd have portions of the military move toward another group. Yeah, I mean, it definitely is not a good outcome, no, no matter what. No. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, Mac Big asks, why is it that basically all preppers are Republican or Libertarian? Is it a lack of trust in the government in general? I don't think that they're, I think that they're more conservative just because they're more traditional. And I think the one thing about prepping is, is you look at things and you see what's going on in the world and the changes that are happening. And uh, a lot of them, some of them are good and we embrace that. And some of them are not so good. Uh, but I think that on the whole, but here's the other side of it. You take the hippies during the seventies, they built communes out in the middle of nowhere. They were all free love and they had their stuff together and they, they built and grew their own food and they separated themselves from the government. And from from society in general. Mm -hmm. So it can go either way. I think it's just yeah. a different name. But I think more and more people across the aisle, either aisle, side of the aisle or the mindsets are looking at things and going, you know what? My dollar's worth less than what it was. Yeah. You know, yes. Antifa, I may be a hyper liberal, radical liberal and live in Seattle and go, oh, my gosh, this city's going to heck because he's yeah. a business owner. And he's like, shoot, man, I need to get out of here. And then he's thinking, what if this happens where I go next? I mean, I think that the, it's a broad spectrum, but you're right. I think most preppers are more more on the conservative side. But I think that there is a growing number of people that are just looking at things through a different lens. And let's just face it. I mean, to me, it's not I'm a prepper because I'm conservative. I'm a prepper because I see the dangers that are going on around mm -hmm. us, you know, with rule of law being lost, with crime going crazy, you know, and with. Uh, the, the border being just overrun with homeless situations everywhere and with the threat of the U.S. dollar, you know, going from the uh, world currency, the petrodollar to maybe switching it to China. That would completely devastate our economy. Yep. So I think that that doesn't affect conservatives. That affects everyone. That's right. Gas prices going through the roof, you know, and all these different things with the economy. So. Yes, I think that the predominant majority are conservative. And I think one of the reasons is because a lot of conservatives are Christians and they, they see revelation and they see that all this stuff has already been, you know, kind of prophesied. So you kind of look at that and go, OK, I see this, this and this and this. Maybe that's right. And uh, I think that's probably one of the biggest factors. Yeah, you say I, I would. I would. I absolutely would. But on the flip side of that, you are starting to see a lot more liberal minded people getting into prepping yeah, because they, like I was saying earlier, they're looking at things through a different lens now and starting to see what can happen. Uh, and I think that 2020 was a, was a big catalyst for that, that these people, a lot of people had their head buried in the sand and thought, you know, we just lived in utopia and everything was great and perfect and nothing was going to affect us. And then 2020 happened and they're like, I could walk into the grocery store and nothing to be available for me to buy to be able to feed my family or, or wipe my butt. And I think that really opened a lot of people's eyes as well on both sides of the aisle. Right. It's a matter of survival. Yep. That's it. <clears throat> uh, Paul made to ask if gun confiscations occurs nationwide, do you think that would start the civil, the next civil war? And do you think our police and military would follow the orders? I think that there are some that would, there are many that would, I mean, there's a lot of local law enforcement here that I know would not put up with that. And, you know, and, and a lot of I know a lot of federal guys that'd be like, oh, no, I mean, you know, <laughs> but uh, there are some that will. And, you know, uh, just like here's the thing, just like in Germany, what happened in World War Two? A lot of those people didn't really agree with what was going on, but they just did it because other what was the other side of it? Well, then they'd been put in a camp or or their families would be with, you know, he'd be without a job or for whatever reason. And I think a lot of times it's just the peer pressure of them doing things they really don't want to do or agree to do. But they just feel like, well, I got to do it. This is my job. And that's not a good way. Yeah. That's a bad thing. But, um, and, you know, I, I do think that that the the gun control issue you know that complete confiscation that that would be a tipping point absolutely for for any almost any gun owner across the country i think that you know if, if the government came out and said oh you know we're we're tired of people having guns we're going to confiscate everything all your firearms all your ammunition that would absolutely be a tipping point i don't i don't think that we would that we would ever see the government come out and make an announcement like that because yeah, they know that that would be a tipping point. It's with, with gun control, you're always going to see little bites, little bites, little bites. You're going to give up a little bit of freedom each time. Okay, we're going to take your bump stocks. Okay, we're going to take your arm braces. Okay, 
we're going to limit your magazine capacity to 10 rounds. No, we're going to limit your magazine capacity to five rounds. No, nope, we still don't like that. We're going to limit it to one round. And you, you're just going <laughs> to see, you're just gonna see your, your, your liberty slowly pecked away at and pecked away at and pecked away at until eventually they're out, they're completely gone. Yeah, there's nothing you can do about That's it. Right. And I That's think right. a lot of people, like myself, it's like th there's a number of reasons why the Second Amendment is important. Obviously, the reason why we still have them is because it's a safeguard against a tyrannical government. Yep. And, you know, and it, will people really stand up? Well, I think, again, we go back to the intolerable when it, if it gets that intolerable. The other part of it is, is I will always have a firearm because if somebody tries to break into my house to hurt my family, I am going to be able to defend myself. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is that alone is a reason. So there are multiple facets, especially those. And, you know, we had a lot of military guys come out. Uh, when we during the Gulf Wars and then, of course, with Afghanistan, they came back like they saw the world. They came back and went, this is bull crap. We got to stand and do what we do. And uh, I think the culture, the gun culture has changed. Uh, I think 30 years ago, people like to go out and shoot. They definitely were kind of still thinking they were still Minutemen, mm -hmm. but they didn't have the tack vest and the, all the training and they weren't doing all that stuff. And I remember the first time I went to the, I mean, not first time, but I went to the, this range is a public range. There's like 12 benches and I walk out with my AR 15 and there's all these guys with hunting rifles. They're sighting in their rifles and they all kind of look at me and I'm carrying my AR and I go set up, you know, and I'm shooting just like they are just shooting some targets. 10 years later, I went back. There was one hunting rifle and all ARs and AKs. Mm -hmm. So I think the whole mindset of the gun community it has changed. Yep. I give a lot of credit to YouTube. It a is, lot it of credit is. to YouTube. The firearm the firearms are definitely much more mainstream now than they were even 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, silencers are mainstream now. Right. Where, where even 20 years ago, you know, there were people that had them, but they were they were definitely not a mainstream item. Where right. where now, you know, things like that are much much more mainstream. I mean, everybody goes, oh, I got to, I'm buying this for my suppressor. I got to do, you know, yeah. and there, oh, I've got to get mine out of jail, or you know, there's a lot of that mm -hmm. conversation. And the AR-15. I That's mean, right. 30 years ago, I had an AR-15, but I didn't really know. But about two or three people that had yeah. them. Yeah. Now I don't know if somebody doesn't have one. I kind of look at them sideways. <laughs> <laughs> And you've only got one. Yeah. What the heck, man? Hey, <laughs> two is one. One is not. But uh, yeah, I think the whole culture has changed to the point to where we really take that and we understand more about what it is that freedom offers and how we've got to protect it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, there wasn't as many threats before. Yep. Now I think they are. And I think there's been things that have happened like Waco and, and Ruby Ridge and some other things that have happened. Uh, but if they just said we're going to confiscate guns, I think we would definitely see. Uh, some real issues. Uh, and I think it wouldn't go well for them because I think a lot of people that they would, they would need to help facilitate that would turn on. So that's just our two cents. Okay. All right. Well, uh, oh, last thing we got to talk about this bug out plan, bug out plan. And, and guys, we all talk about bug out plans and you know, Oh yeah, things happen. Listen, in a civil war situation, it's going to be a little different or could be a little different because you may have the areas that are really where there's uh, hot spots, hot zones, lots of fighting. Yep. And you know, the, and there may, you may need to, you don't want to find yourself in the middle and you may not know that you're in the middle because those lines change. And when mm -hmm. I say lines, Robbie's right. They're not going to be a North and a South. They're going to just shoot across the field. Uh, or like the Revolutionary War, right. it's going to be more or less just guerrilla type fighting going on all over. More like the VC, more like Viet Cong. But those areas got overrun in a hurry. Mm -hmm. And a lot of our troops found themselves, you know, in the middle of a whole, you know. And so um, having a bug out plan with your vehicle, but also having your bug out plans to escape by foot, having loca multiple locations, um, you know, because you know, you may not be able to get to a certain area. That area may be a hot spot. Yep. You may go to that area and find it a hot spot. And that's where bug out, your bug out location and comms are both very important because you, if you have to escape an area, you need to know what's going on in your path, where you're going and your destination when you get there. Right. You know, the thing is, I've always said that, you know, bunkering in is my, that's where we plan. We plan mm -hmm. bunkering in. We have a bug out plan because that could be compromised that your, your home could be overrun or, or people come in or marauders or whoever. But the one thing is, is when you're out there, you are a glorified refugee 
and you're just on the run. And so you really need to take bugging out seriously and have a good plan around it and possible things that could happen in a long-term situation. And that's what most of us do not do. Uh, you know, I've been on both sides, been really heavy and bug out, but still bunkering in, but still heavy. And then I've kind of been like, eh, I'm just going to have a get home bag. I'm not worried about it. And then come to back, you know, even FEMA recommends to having supplies put back mm -hmm. and to bug out and have an evacuation plan. Yep. So if FEMA does that, it's like, really? <laughs> so, of course, they don't they don't have the guns and the ammunition piled in with it. But um, but here's the other side of it, guys. For you to carry the stuff that you really need to carry, you're going to have to have like a 30 foot trailer on the back of your truck. Uh, and honestly, you're going to just leave all your supplies. So if you ever have to do that it's going to be a really bad day. Mm -hmm. It's not something that just, ah, let's bug out. We're going to go to my brother-in-law's over in Georgia. You know, it's, it's a definite, it needs to be a definite plan. It needs to be thought out very well because you're just going to find yourself out there. All right, guys, it's about that time. We really appreciate Robbie for being here. I know this was a pretty somber kind of, um, of course, we are talking about prepping and survival, but you know, you know, I think that this is a topic that a lot of people think about, but just don't know how to, how to broach and, and open up to others and discuss it in a, in an open forum. So I think this is a great, great topic for us to talk about today because it's something that I, I believe is on a lot of people's minds and they just don't know how to, they just don't know how to bring it up and talk about it. Right. Right. And the thing is guys, we're not um, condoning it or promoting it, no. but the fact is, is when certain things just get totally intolerable for whichever side, uh, you know, things can turn violent. And when they do, it could set off a powder keg. Mm -hmm. And again, we're not looking and saying this is going to happen in the next year. But that 30 percent that said possible civil war, they said in the next five years, which is something that was interesting. Um, so, you know, these things can kind of start to, to ramp up and people can start. And so the big thing is in, in the list and it is in the description down below in the in the description. You can look at the little list just to give you some ideas about, you know what, it's not happening, but what, what do I need to do if it happens? And, uh, and having a plan because it does step outside of just your standard prepping. It does. Yep. And, uh, and it's just a thought, but a lot of these can be incorporated into your regular prepping. So we really appreciate Robbie for being here today. And, uh, again, check out Robbie Wheaton's YouTube channel. Also Wheaton arms, a lot of cool Glock aftermarket parts. And, uh, he does some, a lot of custom gun work. And uh, just a good guy and a good shooting partner. <laughs> but uh, also Sarah Mack for monitoring the questions and kind of keeping us informed and keeping us in line. Uh, and also, and I didn't even mention this a minute ago, but uh, Exotac, they give a 20% off using Such00. Down in the description is a link. You can click to it. Exotac makes the best fire starters out on the market. It's good stuff. All right, guys. Y'all got to stay safe. Keep a well-rounded uh, view of what's going on in the world around you. If you're preppers, you definitely should be doing that anyway. Don't get to the extremes. Don't get freaked out. Don't let things jerk you around. You know, emotions are one of the reasons why people are living on their emotions and they're just hair triggers and all that stuff. Guys, be logical. Think things through and make a real plan to have you and your family just prepared. Be strong. Be of good courage. God bless America. Long live the Republic.